We're looking again at the city of Philadelphia here, and we have all those, those parcels that Craig brought in. And they have all the zoning information he brought in from that table and attached to them. And we have a rule, and I, I kind of demoed this briefly, but I wanted to show it again. We have a rule that generates the, the zoning volumes related to those. So the step backs, the setbacks, and the maximum heights. So we can select all these parcels and we can generate, this is, this is according to the regulation, the maximum bailed out you can have for the city. The yellow areas are commercial, the purple areas are industrial, green areas are uh, uh, residential areas. Um, we can change that. We can go in and modify our zoning. So we've selected a set of buildings along the river here. We want to make them into commercial. It just goes in, very quickly change it to commercial. We can change their maximum height. We can change the step back, the step back, right? And these forms actually adapt to that very, very quickly. But these are, these are not, it's not just visualization, right? This is in City Engine. We can take all this data, bring it out, and put it back into the geo database. So here they are in Portland. And then we can compare them against the existing buildings. Now, what you might notice is there have been a few exceptions in downtown. Some of the buildings are very higher. We may want to make a global change to all of our zoning codes, raise them all to 80 feet or 100 feet, right, to represent that change. So we're, we're driving maximum building height by a policy decision. But there's another way to do that, and that's, that's what I want to show, is what if you wanted to drive your zoning height based on a geographic context. So I'm, I'm zooming down to the ground and I'm looking back at the city from the perspective of one of the bridges. And what I want to do is I want to define the, my view and, and say no new building can violate that view. So we have a tool, it's called Skyline. And uh, it takes a, an observer and it takes a, a set of buildings and whatever else you want to feed it, a surface, and it divides the, the, earth from the, ground, uh, the sky from the ground in essence. And it creates this red line. And we'll see it. And you've seen this many times. People draw skylines on a piece of paper. It, you know, you get that, you know, that black effect. But what I want to highlight here is that a skyline is actually a really complex feature. It's reaching out into the distance and grabbing a building that participates far in the back or a ridgeline far in the back. And if we tilt up and we look at it, we can actually see that complexity. And we can actually use this skyline to drive our regulation, right? We, can't, we, we can actually take it to the next step. We can turn this into a barrier. So we're going to use that line of the observer point and we create this barrier. We can turn around and look behind it and look underneath it, right? And it, it kind of forms a, a maximum surface. Now, we built this tool a couple years ago. We gave it to our users. Um, and they loved it. But what really became apparent almost instantaneously is they didn't care about a point. They cared about the view from a park or from a bike path or from the center of the river. So what we have here is we have a route down the river and they want to understand how high they can build without changing the skyline from that, from that boat route, that tourist boat route. So we actually started publishing models. This is a model builder model and it does cumulative skyline, skyline barrier assessment for all these points. There's actually a, a little over 1,100 points going down the river at 100-foot uh, intervals. And then it creates a, this kind of huge database of uh, skylines and skyline barriers. So we wanted to combine those together and it's something that the city could maintain in their database and use to compare against in the future when they got proposed designs. So let's actually run through all these barriers at once and we'll see what they look like. We'll start at the top right. They sweep down across. You can see this tall building in downtown kind of defines the top of that barrier very distinctly from multiple sides. Now, the problem with this, of course, is that there's a lot of geometry. It's very, it's very expensive to do a test against this. But we can sample this and turn it into a surface, an elevation surface that they can maintain and keep. In this case, we did it at a fairly rough, uh, rough uh, sampling rate, just 30 feet. Uh, the blue areas are low, the red areas are high. And if we flip around and we look behind this surface, we can see that the buildings define, in, in essence, like caves underneath this surface. So these buildings, right, they may be zoned for four-story or five-story, but we could change that. We could change the zoning height regulation rather than be policy-based, be geographic context-based. So basically a geo-based design decision about how we're driving our policy. You'll also notice we have these kind of canyons. Those canyons are where 
the observer lines up with the street. It's very distinct. If we sweep back through and we look at that, those skyline barriers again, we can see them kind of carving down on that surface, pushing the maximum height you can build down and looking up those kind of deep canyons up through the city. So we've shown kind of a pre-design policy-driven uh, analysis. We, we also showed kind of an assessment that you might do while you're doing design. But one of the things that's happening is, is uh, of course, policy is evolving. So some cities are starting to define um, the percentage of sky you can see. And other cities have done this. At 60, if you imagine, if I'm standing on the sidewalk and I look up at 65 degrees, some cities say at 65 degrees and above, I can't have a block view. I have to be able to see the sky at that angle. Well, that's, that's one way of doing it, but it's interesting. If you do that in a city, what you wind up with is a whole bunch of buildings with pyramid-shaped tops because everybody wants the maximum amount of space. So then what you do is you make an exception for an architect who's really creative, and then you wind up with a city that's 70% exception. So how do you create a, 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 a policy, a law, that's flexible enough to do that? Well, the city of Philadelphia is a great example. They've done that. They've set at different angles, different percentages of sky that have to be visible. But then the question is, is how do you assess that? How do you measure that? So we worked and we, we uh, did a little, put together a little tool. So here from this, from this sidewalk, we want to understand how much of the sky we can see at a specific angle. In this case, 35 degrees. Here's the model. I'm not going to lie to you. This one is complex. Lots of trig, lots of math. But what it in essence is doing is you give it that area that you're interested, that line. You give it the parcel you're concerned about. It'll go into the database. It'll find any buildings that are coincident with that parcel and grab them and pull them in. Then based on the distance between that line and that parcel, it creates a whole bunch of lines at the specified angle. And then there's an intersection between the two to see whether you can see the sky or not. So the result is a field of lines. In this case, we, we did it at uh, 35 degrees. Takes a sec to run. And the, the lines that are blue have a clear view to the sky. The lines that are red have an obstructed view. Well, uh, the city in this case, the like city of Philadelphia, they might have different percentages at different angles. So we took that tool and we just replicated it into a larger model. And we ran it for a whole series of angles, 15 degrees to 85 degrees. So this is that model. Now here's the great thing about these models. You're looking at these and you're going, oh my god, I'm not doing that. That looks really hard. But the great thing about the urban information model is that we're going to wrap these things as templates. They're built on a standard data model. We build the template to do the analysis. We provide you that template. If you follow that data model, you just run this. You're not going to see this crazy model. You're just going to see the few inputs like the first model that we showed you that you're actually interested in. So we run this model, it generates that whole sweep of lines, 15 degrees to 85 degrees, and then does that intersection. Great, red is blocked, blue is not blocked. We can look at it and kind of guess, right? So at the lower angles, it looks like, I don't know, 60%, maybe 70% obscured in the middle, like 40 and the top not. And then we can quantify that. One way we can quantify it is a, is a graph, right? So here we have a graph showing the different percentages of obstruction. So we realize at the lower levels it's 35, at the upper levels 100, in the middle it's 55%, right? Or we can produce that in a report, right? We have a whole reporting framework now where we can actually do, do a formatted report with graphs and stuff embedded in it. So again, what we're talking about is pre-design, building of geometry to test against, during design, geographic context of the heights of buildings, after design, assessment of buildings to see whether they meet the requirements. And really what we want to do is these, these templates, we want to push them out as services. So the idea is not that the city takes this and runs this when a contractor comes in or a developer comes in and gives them the building. This should be a geodesign service that's available to that developer. And he goes in and when he designs a building, he says, I'm putting it on this parcel. This is my setback. I put my building in its real place on a web-based application. I select the street I'm interested in. I run this analysis, and I see if I comply. And if I don't, I change my building before I even submit it to the city. Let's take the city out, and let's empower the designers to actually do this kind of analysis on a service basis so they don't have to necessarily know the software. But as long as they follow the data model, as long as they're using the services, right, they can utilize this.